Hello, my name is Dr. Eric Madison, Professor of Medicine and Chair of the Division of Rheumatology at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine in Rochester, Minnesota. I will be presenting highlights from the poster, Five-Year Safety and Efficacy of Golimumab in Patients with Active Rheumatoid Arthritis Despite Previous Anti-Tumor Necrosis Factor Therapy, Final Study Results of the Phase Three Randomized Placebo-Controlled Go-After Trial presented at the 2013 ULAR Congress. In this presentation, I would like to address several important questions that this study attempted to answer. First of all, what was the need for the study? We know that about 30 to 40% of patients with rheumatoid arthritis have disease that is severe enough to require biologic therapy. We also know that approximately 30 to 40% of patients on an anti-TNF fail the first anti-TNF for various reasons related generally to safety, efficacy, cost, and access to medication. In this study, we wanted to determine if this now licensed anti-TNF golimumab would be safe and effective in patients with rheumatoid arthritis who have established disease and who have previously been on and failed an anti-TNF such as etanercept, infliximab, or adalimumab. The study methodology was a long-term follow-up of the phase three randomized placebo-controlled multicenter go-after study, which examined the safety and efficacy results of golimumab over a five-year period. In this study, patients were randomized one to one to one to receive initially placebo, that was 155 patients, golimumab 50 milligrams every four weeks, that was 153 patients, or golimumab 100 milligrams every four weeks. That was another 153 patients. At week 16 of this study, patients with inadequate treatment response entered a double blind early escape so that patients who had been on placebo were changed to golimumab 50 milligrams, or if they were on golimumab 50 milligrams, they were changed to golimumab 100 milligrams every four weeks. At week 24, which was the start of the long-term extension open study, the study was unblinded. Patients still receiving placebo switched from golimumab to 50 milligrams per every four weeks. All other patients continued their current treatment. After the last patient completed the week 24 visit, at the time of the unblinding of the study, a one-time golimumab dose increase from 50 to 100 milligrams or decrease from 100 to 50 milligrams every four weeks was permitted at the discretion of the investigator. The last golimumab injection in this long-term follow-up study occurred at week 252. The observed efficacy was rated by an ACR 20, 50, and 70 as well as by the DAS-28 CRP and CDI scales. It was according to the randomized treatment group and as well in this group of patients, the cumulative data safety were reported up to week 268. In total then, in this study, were 461 patients randomized and 459 received the study agent and 183 patients continued treatment through week 252. There were 276 patients who withdrew. The reasons for withdrawal were 86 for adverse event, 107 for lack of efficacy, nine patients were lost to follow-up, and 69 patients were withdrawn for other reasons. Hence, 178 patients completed the safety follow-up through week 268. So to review again, the purpose of this study was to report the final safety and efficacy results through five years of golimumab used in patients with active rheumatoid arthritis despite previous anti-tumor necrosis factor therapy. I'd like to discuss a little bit about the study population in this study. As I mentioned, there were 459 patients that were treated. These patients were well matched by disease duration, which was approximately nine years in all three treatment groups. They were well matched by sex and disease activity at the time of enrollment. 
as well as well matched by concomitant therapy, including methotrexate, which about two thirds of patients were taking at the time of enrollment. In terms of the prior TNF therapy, 48% of patients had previously received adalimumab, and as well, 48% had previously received etanercept. 47% of patients had previously received infliximab. As a group, 66% of patients enrolled into this study received one prior TNF therapy. 25% received two prior TNF therapies, and 9% of patients had been on three prior TNF therapies. The reason for discontinuation for, of the prior TNF therapies was lack of efficacy in 58% and for other reasons in another 56%. In terms of efficacy of those patients completing the 256 weeks of follow-up, 60.3% of patients had an ACR20 response, 42.3% had an ACR50 response, and 21.7% of patients had an ACR70 response. 84% had a DAS28 CRP ULAR response, and 29% of patients had a DAS28 CRP of less than 2.6, which is considered low or well-controlled disease activity at the end of the study. I'd like to review a little bit about the safety data now. Overall, there was no significant difference in the rate of adverse events in the three treatment groups, that is those patients who received 50 milligrams of golimumab every four weeks, those patients who received either 50 or 100 milligrams every four weeks, and those patients who were in the 100 milligram every four week only group. Approximately 90% of patients in each group had at least one adverse event. These were adverse events such as injection site reactions. And again, there was no difference between these three groups. In terms of serious adverse events, there was again no significant difference in the rates of serious adverse events between the three treatment groups, that is, those patients receiving 50 milligrams of golimumab every four weeks, those patients that received 50 and then 100 milligrams every four weeks, and those patients who received 100 milligrams of golimumab every four weeks only. The rate of infections was similar between all of the groups, and the rate of serious infections was about 6.5 for 100 patient years in the 50 and the 50 and 100 milligram every four week groups, and about eight per 100 patient years in the 100 milligram per four week group. With respect to cancers, there were a total of four lymphomas that occurred during the course of follow up of this cohort. Two of those occurred in the patients receiving 50 and 100 milligrams of golimumab every four weeks, and two of those occurred in that group receiving 100 milligrams of golimumab every four weeks. On the basis of the expected rates of cancer, as well as on the basis of comparison between the three groups, there was no increase in the cancer rates in these patients in terms of lymphoma. As well, non-melanotic skin cancers were examined, and here again, there was no significant difference between the three groups and no significant difference in the overall rates of malignancies between the three groups. What are the implications of this study for the clinical practitioner? In my view, this study demonstrates this that golimumab is a safe and effective treatment option for patients with active rheumatoid arthritis, and that it can be used successfully in patients who have failed a first anti-TNF therapy. I would like to point out that the golimumab dose was increased for 70% of eligible patients during the long-term follow-up, likely reflecting the refractory nature of disease in these patients who have previous experience with TNF inhibitors. Is there any need for further study of this drug? 
Long-term studies of survivorship, that is how long patients stay on the drug in actual clinical practice, I think are still needed. Long-term studies of safety of this drug, as well as other TNFs, are still needed. We need to examine the influence of the development of golimumab antibodies on the parameters of safety and efficacy, and this is something that is under review. Long-term studies of the outcomes, such as need for other DMARDs, corticosteroids, orthopedic surgery, ability to work, cost-benefit analysis in terms of quality-adjusted life years, occurrence of RA-related disease complications, and survival in patients receiving golimumab should be done. We also need to better understand which biologics might be the best first and even best second choice for patients needing these types of therapies. Is there anything else that's noteworthy about this study? I think that it's important that all patients receive golimumab after week 24, and therefore there is no control group beyond week 24. The study was open label after that time. Long-term analyses were done using observational data, that is, unblinding had occurred and the treatment occurred at the discretions of the physician and as well the input of the patients after week 24, and thus results may be enriched by patients who are responding well and who remained in the trial. Concomitant medications could be adjusted and patients had an opportunity to change golimumab treatment from 50 to 100 and from 100 to 50 milligrams every four weeks based on investigator judgment. Exposure to golimumab 100 milligrams every four weeks was greater in terms of the number of patients actually receiving that dose and the length of follow-up of those patients receiving that dose. This fact complicates comparison between the golimumab dose groups. Still, although comparative efficacy of golimumab 50 every four weeks and 100 milligrams every four weeks was similar at week 14, just prior to the early decision point about dose escalation at week 16, the golimumab dose was increased for 70% of eligible patients during the long-term follow-up, likely reflecting the refractory nature of the disease in these patients who have had previous TNF therapy. In fact, and encouragingly, improvements in clinical signs and symptoms and physical function observed through week 24 were actually maintained or enhanced for most patients remaining in the trial. What are some of the limitations of the trial? Well, less than half, that is approximately 40% of patients, were available for analysis at later follow-up through week 268. Further, the trial was neither designed nor powered to compare treatment groups beyond week 24, and also dose escalation was at the sole discretion of the investigators. Still, this rate of continuers is very comparable to the number of patients who are still on long-term first-use TNF, and these patients in this trial had already been on an anti-TNF and failed one prior to being enrolled in this study. From previous reports, we know that nearly 50% of randomized patients discontinued their golimumab therapy at week 160, but we see in this extended report of up to five years that nearly 40% of patients were still on golimumab at week 252, indicating good durability of the responders. The fact of these percentages of durability, as well as that of unsatisfactory therapeutic effect and AEs being common discontinuation reasons is not surprising because 35% of these patients who had previous experience with TNF inhibitors discontinued such prior treatment due to intolerance or unsatisfactory therapeutic effect. Thus, this represents a population enriched with patients refractory to and intolerant of such treatment. Approximately two thirds of patients continuing pre-existing methotrexate therapy remained in this study, which is very consistent with what we see in daily use of anti-TNF therapies in the clinic. I'd like to address a few frequently asked questions regarding golimumab and this study. The first is, what is it about golimumab that accounts for its efficacy in patients who have previously failed to respond adequately to other drugs with a similar mechanism of action, that is, other anti-TNF therapies? 
I think that this is likely because of the slightly different biology of this drug compared to other anti-TNF agents. Golimumab is a human monoclonal. It is not a chimeric, but the actual reasons remain to be studied. Golimumab is definitely a very convenient treatment option. Once every four week dosing has a high patient acceptability. Golimumab dose escalation to 100 milligrams every four weeks during the long-term follow-up did increase clinical response rates from before to, to after dose escalation. This fact suggests that patients who have previous experience with TNF inhibitors can benefit from a golimumab dose increase. Another question is, was there any relationship between the particular previous anti-TNF drugs and inadequate response to golimumab? Such a relationship was not apparent from the, from the results presented in this trial. Was there any relationship between the number of previous anti-TNF drugs and inadequate response to golimumab? Again, this is not apparent from the results of this study. The response rates to golimumab, though, are not surprising overall, given that a total of about 35% of these patients, as I mentioned, have had previous experience with anti-TNF inhibitors. The demonstration of long-term efficacy in this study provides additional support for the fact that patients who have received and discontinued a previous anti-TNF for any reason respond to golimumab. Another question is whether there was a relationship between anti-golimumab antibodies and inadequate response. This question is not specifically examined in this poster, although 8% of patients did develop antibodies. This is something that requires further examination. In conclusion, golimumab, I think, is a safe and effective treatment option for patients with active rheumatoid arthritis. It can be used successfully in patients who have failed a first anti-TNF. This group of patients still remains a particularly challenging group to treat. 